Well, good morning, and good morning to those who are joining us on uh, Facebook. Um, on Friday, Governor Hobbs issued an executive order calling for the appointment of an independent commissioner to review execution protocols in Arizona. Attorney General Chris Mays and I met on Friday afternoon, and it afforded us the opportunity to discuss this issue. It was a respectful meeting where we shared in the tremendous responsibility that we have as elected officials who are sworn to uphold the law. In my role as county attorney, the most serious thing I do is determine whether a person should face the ultimate penalty, the death penalty. This is not something that I take lightly. Likewise, I know this is something that the attorney general must approach with great deference. At the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, there is a thorough and thoughtful process when deciding if a jury should be presented with the option of the death penalty for a crime. The decision-making process is guided by state statute and it relies on a review of the facts and evidence in each individual case and that includes mitigating and aggravating factors. As a career prosecutor, I am extremely familiar with this process and was so when I became county attorney. But for those who are unfamiliar with the responsibility, I appreciate the need to understand and learn about this aspect of our criminal justice system. This is why I respect the efforts of the governor and the attorney general to ensure an informed process. This is an act of government that should be handled with the utmost integrity. That being said, I also respect and took an oath to uphold the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona. These govern the role that we play in upholding the rights of victims. Arizona's Constitution guarantees victims the right to a speedy trial or disposition and prompt and final conclusion of the case after the conviction and sentence. Yet families of those murdered by those sentenced to death walk a long and painful path. For most, this is a journey that is decades long. And that is why I hope the review process outlined in the governor's order will be both expedient and transparent. It is my hope that my elected peers will act with integrity and uphold the rights of victims just as the rights of the accused already have been upheld. It is my hope that as a state we will not abandon our promise of justice because justice delayed is justice denied. In the coming days I will be sending a letter to the Attorney General to verify which individuals have exhausted their state and federal appeals and ask that upon the conclusion of the Executive Office's expedient review that justice be carried out. And with that, I will take your questions. Howie? Good morning. Good morning. So when we are talking to victims in death penalty case, potential death penalty cases, we give them a very thorough explanation of what that process is going to look like. Um, so these are people who have hung in, if you will, for a very, very long time. They're aware going in just how long this process takes. And what I would say is, yes, justice delayed is justice denied, but inadequate justice, justice that does not meet the facts of the case, is also denied. And in fact, it never happens. Do you believe that the death penalty, when the decision or the imposition by jury, because it all has to be done by jury now, yes. is, I don't know, the people is the word. I see a lot of data. 
including here in Arizona, they, you know, something about 13 percent of folks on death row are black. So they don't make up 13 percent of the population. So people who can't afford the $800 an hour lawyers and the consultants and the investigators, do you believe that the death penalty can be sought fairly given these inherent issues in there? Well, I, I would disagree with your characterization that people, that there are some people on death row who did not, ha were not able financially to avail themselves of the justice system. Uh, my experience has been that um, extremely experienced attorneys are required to be appointed to each case, two attorneys on each case. Um, if people are indigent or they, they can afford the attorney but they can't afire, afford the experts, the court will pay for those experts. So there are resources available to these individuals. Um, in terms of the racial composition of death row, what you have to look at are each, as I do when I'm looking at a case, I'm looking at each individual case. I'm looking at the facts of those, I'm looking at the mitigation, I'm looking at the aggravation to make sure that that case warrants the ultimate punishment. I, I also would not agree with the characterization that that aggravating factor that you mentioned is, quote, squishy. Um, heinous, cruel, and depraved um, per pertains to the manner in which it is committed. It also pertains to the actions that follow, whether there's, for example, reveling um, in what has just happened. And there are uh, uh, instructions given to the jurors to explain what that is. Obviously, they hear argument from both sides of the attorney, uh, both sides by the attorneys, and uh, they make a decision. But it is the U.S. Supreme Court that has decided that it should be uh, decided by a jury. You know, I, I don't think my personal opinion on the death penalty is what is its issue here. My oath was to follow the law, and the lawmakers in Arizona as well as the public have decided that Arizona is going to be a death penalty state. They've listed the aggravators that I have to take into account. Uh, they've also, I'm also aware of the mitigators that have to be looked at as well, and uh, I review every first degree murder case that is filed in this office committed by an adult and I make a decision based on that case following the law. Jimmy. Well, I'm going to uh, be reaching out to the Attorney General to, you know, compare to make sure that our lists are identical to the Attorney General's list as far as which cases have exhausted both their state and federal appeals. Um, and at that point, I'm going to be watching what Governor Hobbs does. She said she's going to appoint someone to study this, and I'm sure there will be a commission or committee. And I'm going to be watching that. I am hopeful that it is expedient because once somebody has exhausted their appeals, um, the next step procedurally is to seek an execution warrant. So I'm not going to put some sort of arbitrary timeline on this, uh, but I expect it to be expedient.
in due course, we will pursue the punishment that the jury imposed. Or, yes, the judge. Sure. Uh, follow up with one. Uh, it's not the phone call. It's me. Okay. Um, the, I had a question about that in terms of, well, we are assuming all the nonlinear jurors on the panel, and we would only be likely to get two seats for death penalty. We could also have two unanimities. Would you prefer that there were more? Or any thoughts on that? Uh, actually, it was my office that uh, a couple of years, two three or four years ago, um, worked with the legislature in um, eliminating some of the aggravators, and uh, I was a part of that uh, recommendation process. Um, so I think the aggravators that are on the books now are appropriate. I could always, you know, consider other people's opinions in that and um, go from there. So the announcement by the governor does not change the way the Maricopa County Attorney's Office does business. Um, one of the things that I was able to discuss with Attorney General Mays was um, my expectation that the Attorney General's Office, which as you know, handles the appellate process of a death penalty case, that we will um, receive the same sort of attention that it has received in the past, those cases, and the same sort of resources. And Attorney General Mays assured me that if any changes were to be made, that she would notify me of those. What about, you know, the, the study that's being proposed is from the point of somebody being sentenced to death, to being carried out. We have seen um, over the years, I'll use the term looser one, it's not meant to, to confuse, I don't know, but some botched situations where the people can't be the final from all events can't seem to do it right, and it takes forever, it seems like. And I know forever is a, you know, elusive. What changes or assurances or medical study, what would you like to see so we don't see Jimmy and I writing these stories about how long it took somebody to die because they were close to setting the two trials? Well, um, I did attend the most recent execution of Mr. Hooper. That was not my observation um, of that process, but I fully expect the department uh, to be able to carry out an execution that comports with the Eighth Amendment and is not cruel or unusual. That is not something that I would be um, supportive of if it, if it was not within compliance with the Constitution. Well, I would just uh, refer back to my statement. I understand the process that the governor is taking, um, but I expect it to be expedient. Um, there, there has been, as you know, a lot of litigation about the death penalty and how it is conducted in Arizona. I expect the department to be able to carry it out lawfully and constitutionally. I, I am doing neither. I understand they're wanting to do a study, um, and I'm looking. I'm looking to how that is done, but I do support it being done expeditiously. If there is a situation where um, an execution is not carried out in a constitutional manner, obviously that concerns me greatly because as a county attorney, my job is also to protect the rights of the accused. As I said, that was not my observation of the last execution. Um, and I expect that they will look at certain things, but those protocols that are now in place have been, as you know, litigated. Uh, my observation was that uh, he was 
laughing through much of the process. Um, he was jousting verbally with uh, some of the staff. Um, they were, there was a bit of a delay because as the medical technician reported, he was looking for a smaller needle so that it hurt less. And um, he peacefully went to sleep. That's up to the okay. DOC. Yeah, the, so the question about um, whether, th because the Super Bowl is coming to town and oftentimes there is uh, sex trafficking that increases with that. You know, I would just remind people that sex trafficking exists 365 days a year. Um, and yes, sex trafficking does increase um, around large events. And at the time that the Super Bowl is going to be here, there are also going to be two other significant events, including a car show, including a um, golf tournament. And so what I would urge is for the public to be, you know, aware if they see something, say something, report it to law enforcement. Um, we, as the county attorney's office, are in communication with the police about law enforcement efforts. Uh, we intend to hold people accountable uh, for any sort of sex trafficking that occurs here, whether it be the trafficker or whether it be the customer. Uh, sex trafficking, uh, as you know, my background is as a sex crimes prosecutor for 25 years, and I can tell you uh, sex trafficking has a devastating impact on the victim, and so it is incredibly important that we take that seriously. And I also know that there are some uh, trainings going on, including one today of people within the hospitality industry, for example, to look for um, signs and indicators uh, that sex trafficking is taking place. So that's an incredibly important effort. Arizona actually has uh, very robust laws to address sex trafficking. Um, I have worked with the legislature over the years in uh, drafting these laws and improving these laws. And so um, people should be very aware if they're thinking of committing sex trafficking within Arizona that they are facing extremely harsh, harsh punishments, appropriately so. No, I'm good, thank you. <laughs>